Hey guys, today we are in the book of Genesis chapter 17. Yesterday we left off with Abram um, getting his son, but not through his wife, Sarah, but through um, his wife's servant, Hagar, and um, his stepson named Ishmael. Today, we see that when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Think about that. 99 years. That's been 25 years since Genesis chapter 12, where God called him out and said, start walking to the land that I will show you. So 25 years, God has kept his promise. And it says the Lord appeared to him, to Abram probably in the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, right? And so um, just a, another example of God showing up in a physical form. And he said, I am God Almighty. That name, God Almighty, both of those are capitalized. And that's the Hebrew name of God, El Shaddai, meaning God is sovereign. God's hand is on every single day. Uh, on everything that uh, happens. In verse two, he says, I may, that I may make a covenant between me and you. God is reminding Abraham that he has not forgotten the covenant that he promised him 25 years prior, but God wants to kind of re-up this covenant. God's going to show him even more on how God will keep his promises. Um, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of the multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but you shall be called Abraham. What's funny is the name Abram means the father of many. That's what the name Abram means. The name Abraham, it's changed just a little, and now it doesn't mean the father of many. It means the father of many nations. And so here we can see God is changing his name in just a small manner, but it's a huge difference that Abram is going to be the father of, of many, of some, of family of a family, or he's going to be the father of many nations. And so we can see God already knows the future and God is changing his name to, um, to give him um, kind of the encouragement and to let him know what God's plan is for him. Notice in verse six, we see, and it says, and kings shall come from you. This is the first time that God has told us this. This is the first time in Bible that kings will come from the line of Abram. Uh, verse seven, and I will establish my covenant between you and your offspring. So the covenant now is not just with Abram, or Abraham, but it is going to be passed along in generations after Abraham. And we see in verse 8 that he's once again reminding him of the land of the sojournings, the land of Canaan. God is keeping his promise that he's going to give him this promised land, this, this land of Israel that God has always promised him back in Genesis um, 12 and 13. Uh, God said to Abraham, as uh, for you, you shall keep my covenant. Up until this point, the covenant has been one-sided. God has kept all of the covenants. But now here we see that there needs to be something that Abraham needs to do. There has to be not just faith in God's promise, but there must be obedience in God's promise. And so now there's an action. Abraham has to do something to keep his covenant. And what is it? It's what we call today circumcision, the idea of cutting flesh. Um, and it's simply just a symbol of saying that it's the cutting away of flesh. Flesh is bad. Flesh is sin. Flesh is what um, causes bad things to happen and sin to come into our life. So it's the cutting of flesh um, in the faith of the God's covenant that he will fulfill. And so uh, he says that you must be circumcised, not just Abraham, but every male uh, in Abram's family and every male that comes into his family, even though they are not um, 
born under Abraham's lineage. And so this will be a mark to the Hebrew people, to Israel, that they must be circumcised. It's a mark of obedience to show that they will cut themselves, they will mark themselves because they have faith in a God that will do something great. So faith and obedience come together. We see this in the New Testament. We see this uh, in all of Paul's writings. We see this in the book of James. Where there is faith, there must be works, and faith without works is dead. Faith and obedience are coming together. Notice in verse 14, it says, Any uncircumcised male who is not uncircumcised of the flesh uh, of his foreskin shall be cut off his people. He has broken my covenant. So someone who rejects the covenant or the marking of the covenant, someone who rejects circumcision, rejects God's covenant. So the rejection of obedience and faith is the rejection of God. Without faith, without obedience, there is no relationship with God. This is not just a New Testament idea. This takes us all the way back to the Old Testament, to the book of Genesis. And so that's pretty good. God is um, reminding him of everything that's happened, but the, the kind of the highlight of this chapter is to come. And God told uh, Abram, Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name. Once again, God is changing the name of Sarah. Now, for us in the English, it's just one letter, Sarah, Sarah. A lot of times, even people will call it Sarah and Sarah. But that one letter means a lot. It changes what the name means. Sarah means a princess. But it doesn't, it means a princess in a family. It's a princess of uh, a, a family or a small group of people. The, the name Sarah with the H in the English uh, means a princess, but a princess on a many nation basis, on a royal basis. And so uh, the difference is God is saying Sarah, the mother uh, of the son that is to come, the wife of Abraham, just as though Abram is going to be a father to not many, but to nations, Sarah will be the princess to many nations. God is setting him up to know that Abram, Abraham, and Sarah, Sarah, um, is going to be literally the mother and father of the world. And so um, he says, I will bless her and over her, and I will give you a son by her. Notice it says her her, her. You can see that a lot. God is telling Abraham that he's going to bless Sarah. The blessing in which God's going to do is not going to come through a surrogate mother. It's not going to come through Hagar or somebody like Hagar, but the promise of God is truly going to come through Sarah, not a surrogate mom, not a servant, not a slave, but through Sarah. Verse 17, when Abram uh, fell on his face and laughed. Now, this is not laughing at God. This is like a laughing as in he's so happy to hear this. And so um, he falls on his face and laughing and it says, shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old, right? Uh, he's like, I'm old. <laughs> and shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And it's like, we're too old. We're past that. In this, he's not questioning God. He's not saying, are you powerful enough to do this? It's kind of the idea he gets such a good news that he's in a disbelief. And we see that in the very next verse. It says, and Abram said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Abram says, oh, well, Ishmael is going to be this. He's not following God's logic. God said, I'm going to I'm going to bless you, Abraham, and I'm going to bless your wife, Sarah. It's not coming through Hagar. It's not coming through Ishmael. And, and here we see Abram, he's so excited hearing this news. He's not tracking and he says, well, it's, it's coming through Ishmael. And God says, no, it's not coming through Ishmael. God said, no, but Sarah, your wife, will bear a son and you shall call his name Isaac. 
Isaac in Hebrew means laughter. Exactly what Abraham is doing. In the joy that he has before the Lord, he is laughing. And so he says, to prove to you, you're going to name his son Isaac. Laughter. Remember this moment of how I have fulfilled my promise to you. I will establish my covenant with him uh, as an everlasting covenant for his offspring. As for Ishmael, I have heard you and I will bless him. And it goes on and says, I will bless him and I will uh, multiply him and I will make him great. Notice what it says in verse 21. Um, but I will establish my covenant with Isaac, the son that, Abram, uh, that Sarah will have at this time next year. We read this, but we don't think about it. how long does it take to have a child? 40 weeks, nine months, right? It says this time next year, 12 months. God is so great and so powerful. He knows that Abraham and Sarah in three months time will get together. They will get together. They will conceive this child. And nine months later, she will bear that child. So it's not just like, okay, I did it. In nine months, you're going to have a baby. God knows the future. God knows exactly the plan. And he can look at that and he can speak into that. And it just gives us a little glimpse of God's sovereignty. And when he had finished talking with him, Abraham uh, went back to his family and he took Ishmael and he took every male uh, and he circumcised it. Notice it says in verse 23, on that very day. On that very day, he did not wait. Uh, he did not go. He did not uh, do anything on that very day. He was obedient to God's word in the faith of his covenant. Uh, and he put faith and obedience together. You might be asking yourself, wh where's Jesus in in this chapter, in chapter 17. Look at verse 17 once again. Uh, verse 17, I'm sorry, verse 19. It says, uh, God said, no, Sarah will give you a son and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. This is what we call prophetic a message here we can see that this covenant is going to go from Abraham to Isaac and we will follow this covenant all the way through the birth of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ will come through the line of Isaac fulfilling God's prophecy going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. So in verse 19 we see a very glimpse of Jesus once again just another kind of um, point in Jesus' in Jesus's genealogy showing us that God is sovereign and God's promises will always ring true. Hope that makes sense. We will see you tomorrow in Genesis chapter 18. God bless.